Sorry, uh, yeah, my name is Sana Klang. I'm in the City Centre branch for Socialist Workers Party. Um, this meeting is about the pamphlet that John Wollnonger wrote uh, called Case for Socialism in Ireland. Um, John has written a few other books as well, and some of them are on display at the back. You can buy the pamphlet at the back as well for only €3. Euro. Um, our other speaker is Greg Smith, who is a councillor for People for Profit in Ballyfermot and Drimna. Um, so the speakers will talk for about 20 minutes each. And then we'll have lots of time for questions or comments or anything uh, towards the end, unless there's any direct questions they'll come in immediately. But uh, other than that, they'll just summarize at the end. Um, so we're just going to start, and then it will be John's turn, and then everyone will come in. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I don't think I'll speak for 20 minutes because I want to leave the lion's share of the work to the author of the pamphlet explaining uh, what, what socialism means, um, because I think that's an important part of this meeting. But I do want to briefly talk about why I believe there is a very, very strong case for socialism in, in, in Ireland today. Um, I was in Donegal, I'm very involved in the campaign against the property taxes and the water taxes. And um, I was in Donegal on Monday, speaking at a public meeting there, a very big public meeting, about 75 people. Um, and interestingly for me, the meeting was about, you know, I made my introduction, and then after that the meeting was about everything but the property tax. People wanted to know uh, why I was a socialist, what did it mean, um, how do you get change when you have a government that you get them elected and on a certain set of promises and they do everything else differently to what they promised, how could you guarantee in the future that that wouldn't happen. And then one woman stood up and told me she was pro-life and if I was a socialist then therefore I must be for the murder of babies in the womb. And uh, I explained that I was... Um, quite unashamedly pro-choice and that I believed that women were the best experts on the control of their own lives and that indeed had Savita Halapanabar been allowed to be the expert in her case she would still be alive. And with that the audience burst out into a big cheer and a clap. Now I don't know if all of you know the sort of context for why that was surprising to me um, is because in the past for every a referenda on abortion rights, and indeed for the referenda on um, marriage and divorce, Donegal has always voted against any liberal measures. Big block votes, you know, would be seen as a conservative vote in Ireland against any liberal measures. And even when the meeting was over, people came up and shook hands with me and thanked me for being so bold about being pro-choice, about being so honest about it, and that it was refreshing to hear that said publicly in Donegal. To me, that indicates a sea change in what, how people are thinking and how they see, uh, how they see the, the future for this country. What was also indicative was, given that it is rural Ireland, albeit a big town in rural Ireland, in Bunkrana, um, an awful lot of the questions were based around what is socialism, what do you mean by that, how can we get it, rather than just the single issue uh, of the property tax. And I just want to spend a, a few minutes explaining why I believe that the case for socialism in Ireland today is very, very strong. Um, and maybe I'll do that just from the point of view of, you know, sort of a day in the life or a week in the life of a councillor. The day before yesterday, very tragically, um, somebody threw themselves off the third floor inside the council head office on Woodkey onto the atrium and killed themselves. Now, that is um, very, very shocking indeed, and many of the staff are traumatised and have to go for counselling for it. I don't know if that was somebody who was angry with the council over a housing issue, or it was just somebody who planned it, or somebody who lost their mind, or whatever. But there is no doubt about it that the rate of suicide, and the rate of despair, hopelessness and desperation, is hugely intensified and increased in this country today. And that's not just my statement or anecdotal uh, stuff, but it is actually the evidence of the Suicide Prevention Society, of people like Pieta House, and people who are dealing on a daily basis with um, suicidiology and depression and issues uh, related to it. Um, and, you know, I can see why that is the case very, very much up, up, up close and up front, particularly in working class areas and among the poor and the marginalised. Um, I also was at a meeting the other day where, you know, they give account every month to the councils about what's happening in their area in terms of different categories. And one of the categories we were dealing with was derelict sites. There's a site on the canal in Drimna, a big long site that used to house Lyons Tea Factory, and it's been derelict for about six years. And up until recently, the buildings of the old factory were left lying all in bits and were set fire to at one stage. 
at one point there was uh, young homeless people living in it, very, very dangerous conditions, and we were lobbying and lobbying to force the developers who own it uh, to do something about the dangerous con condition of the site. I think about six or nine months ago, they did actually uh, sort it out and clear it. Um, these developers, by the way, some of them are some of the richest footballers in the in the UK. There's a, a, a what do you call it conglomerate or a, a corporation of different footballers who bought property around Ireland and want to develop. So very very wealthy people. It took them a long long time to clear the site. They've accrued derelict fine fines of nearly half a million. And I asked at the meeting, what were we doing about it? And we said, well. The law agents will probably write to them sometime in the future, but we often find there's no point in this, but we will inform them of their legal obligation. That morning I had attended a meeting for the third time with a young woman who has four children, the eldest of which is a very, very disabled uh, young girl, uh, both intellectually and physically disabled. She's a tenant of the councils. She was €4,000 in arrears. The reason she was in arrears was because she had to borrow heavily to build an, a, a disability extension for her daughter. The council had promised to do this, but when the bike banking crisis hit, uh, they told her we've no money, but you can go and borrow and get it built. And as a consequence of that borrowing, she fell into arrears. And they had that poor young one tortured, threatening her with legal action, eviction, all sorts of, the world is going to come down on her head. She owes 4,000. The rich developers owe nearly half a million, and who are they going after? And this is not just one example, but this is a constant, constant feature of what's going on uh, in this society. I also was discussing this with John the other day. There was a, a report in the Financial Times during the week. Um, the Financial Times, of course, is not an Irish press uh, uh, paper, but it's obviously a very clear reference point for what goes on in the financial world. And they are predicting a massive a mortgage crisis in this country over the next, uh, within the next brief period of six months to a year. And that crisis, they predict, will result in hundreds and hundreds of families being evicted from their homes. And when you think about it, it's not that long ago, I think it was actually on International Women's Day, ironically, Christine Lagarde, who came over here to have a breakfast with women for International Women's Day, upper class women, mind you, not, uh, not the kind of women in this room, um, made the statement that the Irish government really has to do something about the banks going after people for mortgages. So this is another big train of depression and despair and hopelessness and attack coming on, on the, the worst of people uh, in this country. And uh, really when you think about that and look at what happened during the week with the, the, pe the pension and the wages of the bankers, and in particular I'm going to use the example of Richie Boucher here, that guy earns in a week what a nurse is paid in a year, right? Now, you can think of, how, how would you resolve things under socialism? Well, for starters, you could employ 52 nurses and tell Richie Boucher to go on the old age pension. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? It would make a hell of a lot of difference. My man's in hospital at the moment and everybody knows when you're up against it and somebody's very ill, a nurse is worth their weight in gold as against a banker who sits on his arse and makes a mess of the country uh, getting paid the salary of 52 nurses. I mean, think about those sort of things. There's really obscene waste and um, inequality that takes place, that takes place in, in, in this country. But the thing I want to focus on, because I, I come up against it all the time, for the real case for socialism, uh, if you like using the, the business parlance going forward, in this country, and that is the question of how young people are being treated. Um, we all saw during the week the, the unemployment figures for young people in Spain, 59% or some crazy figure now, people under 25, the rate of unemployment. But in this country, the last figures we got for the rate of unemployment among those under 25 was about 24%. So it's not, um, it's not beyond a stretch of imagination that if this austerity continues, if they keep taking money out of people's pockets, that we'd be hurtling towards those sort of figures. But in the meantime, what are they doing to um, this generation, this young generation, and the next one after it? They're cutting massively all the benefits to children. Labour Party, remember, got into Paris saying that they would never touch child benefit. They've now implemented a cut of, um, I think it's 10 euro a month for the first child, 18 euro a month for the second child, and for every child after that, uh, 20 euro a month. And I listened to a traveller from Pavy Point the other day being interviewed. She's eight children. Can you imagine what that cut means to her? 
in terms of uh, the poverty that she's experiencing as a result of that. Because once you go beyond the three, for every child she's, she's losing uh, 20 quid a month, which amounts to, after three, she's losing five, five three, she's losing 100 a month. And that amounts to over 500 and, uh, sorry, sorry, amounts to 1,200 a year of a cut to somebody who's already uh, living on the breadline. You then move up a little bit, and all of the travellers' projects in general have been cut by about 30%. Traveller funding, special funding for travellers in schools, um, special needs assistance for travellers in schools. They've really been hit very, very hard. And there's a very interesting survey done by Paddy Point during the week which shows this. I also attended a meeting this week where we were taking the council to task for refusing to draw down what amounted to about 16 million in funding that was allocated by the Department of Environment for traveller specific accommodation. And it emerges that it wasn't just Dublin City Council that refused to draw it down, it was also Clare, it was also Limerick, it was also Cork, it was also Galway, it was also Fingal. There's been a sort of deliberate um, choreographed state policy to um, force travellers into private rental accommodation. They would never admit it and they hide behind the mantra of antisocial behaviour and uh, violence, antisocial behaviour and criminal activity. And as I pointed out to them, uh, maybe a level of antisocial behaviour and criminal activity among travellers, there's a huge degree of it among the political establishment and the bankers. And nobody is going, nobody is going after them. <laughs> In Ballyfermot, we had a, a regeneration project for the travellers who were there since 1967 and only recently got uh, access to water, sanitation, and electricity, formal, legal, proper, safe access to it. And the regeneration project can't have it, can't have it, there's no money. They kept telling us there's no money. In actual fact, they refused to draw down 16 million from the Department of the Environment. You then move to look at what's happening with the rest of the youth in the community. 14 to 16 percent cuts in youth funding. Now, some people have the impression that youth funding is all about youth clubs and discos and trips out to Wicklow to walk in the hills. Not at all. Most of the youth funding in areas like Ballyfair, them who come from um, broken families, poverty, don't get fed properly, end up maybe going on drugs and into prison. And actually, for every penny they spend on these kids, they save hundreds uh, at the other end of the spectrum because there's very good intervention made that get the kids when they're very young, sort them out with their educational needs and begin to give them a bit of hope and a bit of belief in themselves. That funding's being cut by 16%. Uh, the education cuts for the working class specific uh, third level education, by this I mean post leaving cert um, courses and further education courses in the VEC, now being cut by a massive amount so that there's hundreds of teachers are going to be displaced from that, um, from that area of education, which will leave somewhere like Ballyfermot, <coughs> 10 teachers less. That means a whole pile of courses are going to fall, it'll have a domino effect, and there's much less uh, uh, possibility that even the 3% of that community that get to third level will, will be able to, to achieve that. So I really believe that these sort of um, austerity measures on the working class, but on working class youth in particular, are going to create a massive crisis in the next five to six years. A massive crisis for people uh, whose lives will be full of despair and hopelessness and alienation. The jobs are not there, they're not investing in jobs. Instead, they're, you know, as we said, pouring money into bailing out the banks, creating austerity measures that cut jobs even further. And for me, that's really, if you like, the future is about these people and it's about how do we get a society that treats them with respect, that gives them hope, that gives them an education, that even feeds them, because the evidence is there that more and more children, I think it's one in five children, are going into school hungry. All of the schools in Drimland and Ballyfermot have had to set up breakfast clubs in order to ensure that kids get something into their belly before they start a, a day's class. Now, some people might think that I'm exaggerating, but these are all, these are all uh, statistics and realities that are out there, and that are hidden, really, because our politicians and our rulers decide to live in this bubble that talks in terms of figures and percentages and how we can all have to bear a little bit more pain, a little bit more pain, a little bit more pain, but actually they take none of it. And the figures are out there to show that the top 1% of Irish society has increased their wealth 
by something like 16 billion in the same period that our section of society and, and the poor have decreased in their income by nearly 25% in the same period. And this inequality can only be addressed by challenging the illogical, chaotic nature uh, of the system. And I want to say that very strongly because when the people in Donegal ask me the question, what do you do about a government who gets into power on a set of promises, breaks them, and then you think you're going to elect a new government, let's say a Fianna Fáil, Sinn Féin coalition government, that's a possibility in the next election, and they give you a set of promises and they, they, they fail to fulfil them. And how I answer that is that if you have a government elected on the basis of promises to, um, if you like, repair the system and repair the damage done, they may or may not be able to fulfil some of them. They may try their damnedest to fulfil some of them. Perhaps some of them will commit to a promise to get rid of the property tax. They're all promising that at the moment, that if they got into power, they'd get rid of the property tax next time round. The problem, however, is that once those parties and those politicians and that political ideology accepts the logic or the illogic of the capitalist system, then they end up managing it, supporting it, decorating it, foosting around with it, and trying to make it work. And therefore, I believe it is only socialist principles that are capable of challenging that chaotic and, uh, and, 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 and bitterly divisive system. Um, I don't believe that socialism will be delivered from above, and I know John is going to go into that and we can have a lot of discussion on it. By that I mean I don't believe that if you elect Richard Boyd Barrett or Breed Smith or Joe Higgins that they can actually prescribe it and hand it down to society. Socialism is something that we have to take. It is about justice and equality and it is about the vast majority of people fighting for their rights and taking back our society and running our society in our interests, not in the interests of the tiny elite. Um, and I just want to finish by talking about uh, Northern Ireland because it sometimes gets missed in, in, in these discussions that this is an island that has a border. I crossed the other day, got an awful fright. By the time I got to Straban, Vodafone texted me and told me I'd spent 50 euro on roaming data. I hadn't even turned it on, so I'm fighting with Vodafone at the moment. Nevertheless, you don't realise you're crossing a border anymore, you know, when you, when you, when you drive through Ireland. Um, but nevertheless, it is a divided state. And equally in the north, you have austerity measures being implemented, and worth noting by uh, Sinn Féin in the coalition government. They've taken two billion out of the public sector spending. They're about to help the Tories implement a bedroom tax. You know, it's farcical that we're being taxed to live in our own home. But in Britain, the Tories are implementing a bedroom tax. So if you have an extra bedroom that you're not using, you pay a heap more tax on it. Um, and so you find parents who've reared their families, there's a bedroom empty there. They're, if it's a council ho home uh, of any shape or form, they're going to have to pay a huge amount of tax on it. So in the north you also have a similar situation. In fact, probably in some ways the poverty among children and women in particular is even more stark than it is here. And interestingly, and you'll see this thing, go this thing going around, the north is hosting the cheerleaders of austerity. The biggest uh, gangsters in the world are coming to Northern Ireland in June to decide on the future, the near future of this planet in terms of the climate, global warming, the economy, wars, militarism. And I think that's a real, a real kind of statement in itself that somewhere like Ireland with the peace process and all that going on, and in particular in the north of Ireland, is being used by the Tories to host this uh, mega event of, of, of the, uh, the, the, the gang leaders of capitalism globally. Um, and the people in the north are, 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 are mobilising to, to oppose them. I think we should join with them in that because the only solution uh, to the division in this country, just as it is the only solution to the division within our class, the division between men and women, the division between black and white, the division between rich and poor, the only solution is struggle. And it is about trying to change, fundamentally change that system uh, to turn it on its head and create a society that John is going to explain how it will work. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, uh, First of all, it's great to see so many people here, and particularly nice to see uh, 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 quite a lot of people here who I've never met before on the Irish left, so it shows there is an interest uh, in making the case for, for social. I mean, Breed made, I think, an unanswerable case 
for the rottenness of this system and the need to change it, just simply on the basis of her day-to-day -day experience with uh, dealing with it. I, I sometimes think that, in a, in a way, that the newspapers and the media, despite themselves, make an unassailable case for the rottenness and changing the system just by reporting the news. But what I want to, to stress here, following on from and building on everything that Breed was saying, is to uh, make the case that we do specifically need a socialist solution to the problems uh, that we've got. Quite a bit of it uh, that Breed has said already, I want to uh, expand on that, uh, really. I want to argue why we need a socialist response rather than some of the other uh, responses. Rather than, say, a nationalist response or a republican response or a, um, or, or a, a, a legalistic response, a constitutional response and so on. It's not enough, I want to say, to say, you know, let's go back to some pure constitution or something like that. I want to make that the case for me, for, for specifically for socialist change and what that would mean. Uh, I want to start with the fact that the crisis we're in, which everybody in Ireland knows about, from whatever point of view you, you, you look at it, and everybody feels in one way or other, except a very few people at the top, that that crisis is a crisis of capitalism. By that I mean it's a crisis of a system in which production is for profit. That's the nature of the crisis. It's not a peculiar crisis of Ireland. It's not a peculiar crisis of the fact that there's something wrong with Irish capitalism. Some people used to, David Williams and people used to say, it, the trouble is it's not real capitalism, it's crony capitalism and so on. I want to say, no, it is real capitalism that is in crisis, but I want to em uh, uh, emphasise that. It's not just a crisis of the bankers and the developers. Now, I'm sure that everybody in this room, you're probably the, you're the wrong meeting if you're not, uh, are angry about the way the bankers have treated Ireland and what they've done. Uh, to us, of, uh, of course. But let's just think about what they did for uh, a second. What did the bankers and the developers do during the boom? Essentially, they lent money, not their own money, they lent the bank's money recklessly, and they borrowed money recklessly. Right? And why did they do it? To make as much profit as they possibly could. Well, just a few comments about this. This is what you're supposed to do if you're a capitalist. That's what they pay those bankers those inflated salaries for, is to make as much profit as you possibly can. And in booms, that's what capitalists and bankers and developers always do. Right? They borrow as much as they can, they lend as much as they can to capture as big a share of the market, and so on, uh, uh, etc. There's nothing peculiarly Irish or unusual about that. And when you look at the history of capitalism as an economic system, you find that it is a history of booms in which that happens, and then the bubble bursts, and then you get crises. And therefore, we find that we have an international crisis. We have a, a crisis that is in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, in Cyprus, in Britain, and a crisis that started in the United States. And just think about how the crisis started in the United States. Just like the, the uh, Wall Street crash started in the United States in, in 1929. It started, it broke, it didn't really begin, but it broke with Lehman Brothers going bankrupt in 2008. I don't know how many people in this audience remember that even now, but that's how it broke upon the world. Before that, you had something which was pretty obscure sounding, uh, which is you had a crisis in the subprime mortgage market. They always invent terms for these things that ordinary people won't understand. Yeah. Uh, you know, so keep you confused. And you're all supposed to, you know, just like nobody understands what derivatives are and the stock market. They, they, they use these terms. What does it mean, subprime mortgage? It means they lent money to people who didn't have enough income to pay it back. And they were quite happy to do that Right? Because then they repossessed the house they'd lent and resold the house. So they made double profit on the, on the whole thing. And they started the whole, and that worked very well when there's a boom. The moment the boom goes bust, the bubble bursts, then they couldn't resell the houses, then it impacted on the banks, and then we had the banking crisis and so on. Uh, 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 so. In other words, what they were doing in America 
was the same thing they were doing here. It's what capitalists do, it's why we had a boom in the 20s, a slump in the 30s, a boom as a whole did in America, and Britain and elsewhere in the 50s and 60s, slumps again in the 70s and 80s, then a boom at the Celtic Tiger time, and another slump. Now, that's uh, uh, what they do. It is a crisis uh, of capitalism uh, uh, at, uh, at the uh, heart of the matter, and that we need to understand, because we're going to get many more years of it. It's, there's no way in which they're out of the problem yet. Um, I also want to stress that we have, uh, as we all know, a social crisis in Ireland. One of the best examples of which Brief was referring to, uh, and namely the whole uh, question of a woman's right to choose, the whole abortion question. And we have uh, this situation of a quite disproportionate influence still in the country exercised uh, by the, uh, the conservative bigots uh, uh, of the church and so on. And we've seen this spelled out in the newspapers uh, every day for the last few days uh, uh, over what, they were, what kind of legislation they were going to introduce and come up with a, they call it a compromise, really. It's a horrible solution which will inflict all sorts of, per, uh, uh, of pain on any woman who goes anywhere near it in terms of what they're proposing with their... Uh, three doctors and their possible 14 years in prison and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, but the point I want to make is that's not just something separate. There's a link here. Right? And there's a link in Ireland and internationally with the system. What the, these people who are opposed to a woman's right to choose say they're pro-life. But think about it a minute. That's how it These people Again, not only in Ireland, but historically and in America and everywhere else where they get a lot of their money from and so on. These people are pro-war, pro-death penalty, many of them, pro-torture, they have been uh, historically. They wrestle with their conscience about the abortion like all the Fine Gael people do wrestle with their conscience about that. They don't wrestle with their conscience about cutting child benefit. There were no Fine Gael TDs agonising about that. The only time they become pro-life is when, it, uh, when uh, they're, they're talking uh, uh, about the fetus in the world. That's the only time they become pro-life. Why? Because they have a class instinct to understand that the more they can deprive women, and men for that matter actually, same principle over euthanasia and so on, the more they can, de they can deprive people of control over their own bodies, their reproductive rights, and so on, the easier they are to control generally. And that's why you would find you know, the right wing in America regard this as such a key issue, uh, and so on, uh, etc. And that's why they'll send so much money to fund the uh, anti-choice campaign here. It is part of the system and the same ruling class. And then the politicians. You go into any working class community, in Ireland, I think, and you will find people rightly railing against the politicians. They're all corrupt. They're all just in it for themselves. And they're quite right, many of them are. I won't say all, but many of them are. And the system is thoroughly rotten. The situation where they can make promises and then break them with a shrug of um, the shoulders, like they did over child benefit. You know, people see, I don't know if people have seen the actual footage of Eamon Gilmore saying, he was asked, what wouldn't a Labour government do. One thing we would not do, we wouldn't be in a government that would cut child benefit. And so, then he goes ahead first, but uh, Rory Quinn signed a pledge over student fees. He's, uh, you know, he went in front of a student demonstration and signed it because he wanted the students to vote for it. Tore up his pledge without thinking. They do this. They get away with this. It's shocking. It's true. But if the politicians, we have to think more about this. If the politicians are Corrupt? Yeah, we should be able to get rid of them. We should be able to recall them. Absolutely. Socialists have always uh, been in favour of that. Karl Marx was writing about it in relation to the Paris Commune in 1871. The Chartists, the, one of the first workers' movements in the world, back in the 1840s, wanted annual parliaments to deal with this kind of problem. Uh, and so on. Yes. But think about that. If you're going to have politicians who are corrupt, who corrupts them? We can all think of the names of corrupt politicians, can't we? Like Lowry, Michael Lowry, and so on, the Moriarty trucking. But who bribed Michael Lowry? Nobody in this room could afford to bribe Michael Lowry, could you? 
You, would, you wouldn't be able to pay for his lunch. <laughs> How rich do you have to be able to buy bribe Michael Lowry? I'm sure somebody, who bribed Michael Lowry? <laughs> the name in particular, go on, you won't be done for, you're not going to see. <laughs> Dennis O'Brien bribed Michael Lowry. Now, on this rich list, Briggs referred to it here, that the, this was in the Sunday Times, the, I, um, the rich list for Irish, uh, uh, Ireland and Britain, Britain and Ireland. Right. There's a special thing on Dennis O'Brien in that. As Brie was saying, the Irish rich, along with the rich, generally got richer uh, um, during austerity, particularly in the last year. Last year, Dennis O'Brien's wealth increased by £1.2 billion. Pounds. Not euros, pounds. That's even more than euros. Increase of £1.2 billion. Now, can you get your head around that? I think they rely on the fact that people, ordinary people, can't get their heads around or don't stop to try and get their heads around. It sounds like 1.2 million. No, it's 1.2 billion. You see, I was interested that, that Bree pointed out that Richie Boucher's uh, 800,000 was 52 nurses. Yeah. I don't know if you can do the maths with the head, but 1.2 billion, which was Dennis O'Brien's increase, is more than a thousand times Richie Boucher's salary. Isn't that, you think about that? We get angry about Richie Boucher. Dennis O'Brien is increasing his wealth last year is more than a thousand times Richie Boucher's uh, salary. He's not the only one. The, uh, Hillary Weston uh, uh, owns Brown Thomas and loads of other stuff around the world. Her wealth increased by 750 million. Now, I'm not making these points out of envy. Of course it's unfair. It's unjust. It's unjust that anybody should have. That's not the key point I want to make. The point I want to make about them is the social, economic, and political power that kind of wealth gives you. That's the point I, uh, uh, I, I want to make. Because with that kind of social, uh, economic, and political power, they determine the priorities of the system. And that's what we need to deal with. James Connolly said, he was talking about the British rule here, and I quote him, he said, if you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organisation of the Socialist Republic, your efforts will be in vain. England will still rule you. She will rule you through her capitalists, her landlords, her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country. I want to paraphrase commonly a bit here and say, if you run up the red flag over the Doyle, right? If you elect, like the brief was saying, if you elect a hundred Richard Boyd Barrett's of Joe Higgins's, right? Even if you blow the damn thing up, you blow the Doyle up. The the Dennis O'Briens, the Tony O'Reillys, the Dermot Desmonds, the people who got bribed the politicians, they would still rule you because they control the wealth of, of the country. They control the resources and so on. So the question we have to pose if we want to talk about a decent society, better society in Ireland or anywhere else, we have to say, what do we do about those people? What can we do about them? Well, obvious thing you could say you would do is tax them. And of course they should be paying more tax. The fact that they and the corporations so pay almost no tax is an absolute scandal. Right? But we all know what they say if you say tax them. They say, oh, well, they take their money out of the country. Actually, they take a lot of their money out of the country anyway, even when you don't tax them. Uh, okay, they try and take their money out of the country. You can introduce exchange controls. You can do that. Cyprus did it in the class. You introduce exchange controls. They probably still get a lot of their money out anyway, whatever you did, because they're so powerful. I'll tell you something else they could do, though. They would go on investment strike. They would withdraw from investment, and then we'd have more unemployment and so on. So in other words, yes, tax them. But once you start doing that, you set a process, they will fit, hit back. If you want a decent society, you, you want a democratic society, in the real sense of the word, you have to take the wealth off them. You have to establish social, collective, and democratic control of the wealth and the resources in society. And that's the essence of socialism. That's what we're saying has to be done if we're going to have a decent society. Now, I, just, I want to stress there's the dem democratic element of that as well. Right? And again, you can quote, either you could quote Marx or you could quote Connolly on this. Remarkable similarity between a lot of the things they said. 
But Connolly said specifically, state ownership is not enough. If you just establish state monopoly with this kind of undemocratic state, without the control by working people, you don't have socialism, you just have state capitalism. It has to be democratically controlled. And from that, and from that it follows that it has to be done by working people themselves. Right? It can't be, as, as Breed said, it can't be good. Can we do this? Well, it, would, it means a revolution. That's what it means. And by a revolution, I don't mean just a couple of hundred people m marching down to the GPO with guns and occupying it. I'm not talking uh, about that, heroic as that was. Because what we have to do is not just get a, a foreign ruler out of the country or get rid of a few people, we have to build a new society and that has to come from the people. So we're talking about mobilising hundreds of thousands of people, people in there, hundreds of thousands on the streets, in every town and so on, and we're talking crucially also about mobilising people in the workplaces. What we need, actually, is not one Vita Cortex uh, uh, occupying their workplace, we need a hundred, a thousand Vita Cortexes and together. We need not just one big demonstration, we need masses of people. That's what we're talking about. And then we have the power, and that's what we need to do, to dismantle the existing state apparatus, the existing power, and replace it with a democratic power from people's assemblies, from workers' assemblies, and the workplaces and the communities and so on, uh, that would give you real accountability, real recallability, uh, real uh, democracy uh, for the first time. Can we, can we do that? I believe we can. First of all, we can do it because we have the power. Right? Working people have immense power because all their millions, billions and trillions of wealth comes from the labour of working people. It all comes from, an, uh, from our labour. Not a train, not a bus, not a tram, not a plane will move without the labour of, uh, of working people. Not a newspaper is printed, not a television programme broadcast, not a film made without the labour of working people. They can't do anything without our labour. So we have huge power to defeat them if we use it. What do we need? Yes, I think it can. You look at history, you find that it does actually happen. And it's happened quite a lot. It doesn't happen enough. It doesn't happen when we, just when we want it to. I'm not trying to say it's going to happen tomorrow. I don't mean that, but history shows that it can happen. Right? It happened in the Russian Revolution in 1917. It happened in Spain in 1936. It happened in my lifetime. I saw it happen in Paris in May, uh, and France in 1968. It happened, in a way, recently uh, in Egypt in 2011 and so on. Didn't go in a socialist direction, but the mass of the people rose up and overthrew a dictatorship and so on. It can, uh, it is a real possibility that that can happen. And we have the conditions developing in Ireland and internationally that make uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, a real possibility. Right, now I'm I have to wind up, I think, in a, a minute, which leaves a lot of questions. And I know that whenever you talk about socialism to people, there's a host of questions. Please ask them. Um, I haven't got time to go into all of them, but, you know, would socialism work? What would be the incentive for, for people? Don't you always have to have rulers? Uh, how could it be in Seoul? I know there's all those questions. I just want to say this, that if we could do this, and we could establish democratic control of uh, production, then I think it's, we would start producing for human need. I think if you put the democratic assemblies of working people, do you want to have, do you want to spend, as Ireland does, a billion a year on army uh, and navy and air force to fight who, God knows, mm -hmm. but for the prestige of the state, do you want to do that or shall we have some more hospitals? Do we want uh, uh, to build lots more hotels and ghost estates? Or do we want to meet people, uh, people's needs by improving schools and so on? Do we want special needs assistance in, uh, um, uh, in schools? Or do we want to... You know, I think you put any of those basic questions, people would make, per without any doubt, perfectly sensible and reasonable decisions. And if we do that with the resources, 
Actually, there's no reason why anybody should be unemployed. There's loads of tasks that you can get people to do. You would increase production of useful things for people. There'd be no reason for anybody to be living in poverty. There'd be no reason in, in Ireland uh, in 2013 where one child, never mind one in five children, would go to school hungry. And when you think about it on a world scale, the, 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 what we could do uh, would be absolutely uh, extraordinary. So I think that, that there is that possibility for creating a decent society <coughs> once we start producing for, for human need. And the last point I'm going to say is what do we have to do to bring this about? Well, because it actually has to be done by people themselves, right, who can't be delivered from above by, uh, by TDs or whatever, standing in elections is useful. It's part of the process, but they can't deliver it. Because it has to be done by people themselves, we have to be involved in the struggles of people themselves. Just like Breed was talking about, you know, and many <coughs> people in this room will have been involved in the struggle uh, uh, against the property tax, or the, the, the struggle for choice, or um, the struggle to defend our uh, natural resources and stop them selling off the, the forests, or whatever the issues are, the schools, the hospitals, or whatever, whatever issues people are struggling with, we have to be involved in that. But at the same time, that we need to develop a, a a political alternative. There needs to be an alternative for at elections so that people can um, uh, uh, vote in, in a progressive way. And there needs to be an organisation in all those struggles that is making the case we're trying to make tonight, that is the case for socialism. Because it is when people are involved in struggles that their ideas start to change and they become up. So we have to be making the argument for socialism in the property tax campaign, in the struggle defend our natural resources in the struggle for a woman's right to choose and so on and so forth. And doing that, we need an organisation. So I would end by simply saying, if you like what uh, Reid and I are saying tonight and you like what we've got to say, I hope you'll think, uh, uh, you'll think very hard uh, about joining us and helping us to build the kind of organisation uh, that, that can hopefully fight for a decent and socialist society in Ireland. Um, so if you want to ask a question or make a comment, just raise your hand and I will take a note of you and uh, come to you in due time. So please feel free, there's no need to make any speeches or anything like that. Any question is welcome and any comments as well. Me. <laughs> Given that a lot of the, the, well, the church and a lot of its members are on the anti-choice side of the debate, I was wondering if you thought that it would help the pro-choice side to be arguing from, from a Marxist materialist point of view, um, or if you think that maybe given that this country is so entrenched in Catholicism, that that would actually hinder the debate? Long um, overdue that we get out from under this capitalist system. And I love what Reid was saying earlier because I've experienced it firsthand myself, the destruction of communities. Because a small number of people are having their say and dictating the way our lives are run. I mean, we in communities could see the problems that, you know, not, not this time around so much, I'm not involved, but the last time that as they were cutting back, the social problems were increasing in the area. And, and that's the problem with inequality. The short term, thinking and, and the interests of a small minority are, are dictating all our lives, you don't see that it, that level of inequality eventually hits them because maybe the youth on our estate are out burglar and bur doing burglaries because they can't afford, you know, the, for extra money or whatever. It causes bad effects on the whole of society, but they only see it in terms of themselves. And then they probably have to spend more money on policing and security. I know we have the heavy heavies on the Lewis at the moment, the big... Uh, uniformed guys up and down to where I live anyway so I, I just think that if we as a people have more say and control over our lives like what it would be in a social society you'd know what's good for your area you'd know what's good for the young people and where money should be diverted or you know put but instead you have this top down thing and it's all about profit and I know my area anyway was like kind of a failed development we were to have all kinds of not just the houses up there, we were to have a school and we were to have 
shops and we would have this, that and the other, but when the profits dry when the incentive dried up for all these developers, they just left us with the houses, no footpaths, no lights, no shops, no buses, just thrown up on the side of a mountain and uh, get on with it. And a lot of social problems developed for that. So if you, if you have vested interests dictating how the rest of society goes, I think that's what you end up with, inequality, social problems, and it hits everybody. So I want to free us from this uh, capitalist system and start having more actual direct democracy. I think the ideas of socialism that we would have local you know, councils or whatever deciding what's good for the area of, of people. And we need to start standing up and not feeling that we don't, I used to feel that you didn't have really enough intelligence to have a say about the running of the country, that politics was all above me and beyond me and the great and the good were running the show and you just kind of got on with your life. And I, I listened to some talks since joining um, Socialist Workers Party and what brought it home to me was a man called Pat Stack saying, if you don't feel confident about having a say in your life, just think who they had the most powerful position in the world. A B-movie actor, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> elected in America. We have to start getting confident, speaking out, and having more of a say in how our lives are dictated, particularly at the moment with all the... ...of abuse that's heaped upon working class people, that's heaped upon our communities, that's heaped upon lone parents, the poor, home helps, homeless people. You know, all the devastation that's, you know, on a daily basis heaped on people in this society. And you go, well, how does he have the confidence to actually walk around? You know, how does he have the confidence to get in and out of his car and pass this by every day? Why isn't he worried that we're all going to get him? You know, does he wear a suit of armour or... You know, if you put Dennis O'Brien at the front of this room, you know, with his uh, six billion dollars in a pile behind him, and said, right, Dennis O'Brien, you know, meet a room of uh, 60, 70 people. You know, I think we'd be able to take the money off him. So, like, where does he get his confidence? You know, and, and the fact that we don't take the money back off him, so where did they get their confidence? And I think because they know that somebody's got their back. Dennis O'Brien knows that six billion, it's not just about money. Six billion buys you control. Six billion buys you control of the political establishment. Six billion buys you control of the media. Six billion buys you the ability to shut down significant sectors of the economy if the left ever come to power. Six billion gives you power and control. So he knows he's got that six billion at his back. And even if you challenged him and put your hands on that six billion, he knows he's got the army generals, the state bureaucracy, the civil service, the people who run the police, all these unelected people, he knows they've got his back. So he's very confident. He's quite happy to walk by pools of misery with a gay smile on his face because he's got six billion in the bank and we're not going to do anything about it. So that's where he gets his confidence. So shouldn't we be thinking the same way? Shouldn't we be saying, well, hang on a minute. If you're a lone parent somewhere in the middle of Ireland uh, and you want to protest against the cuts, well, you're going to go, am I the only one who wants to protest? Does anybody else want to protest? Without organisation, without knowing that people have got your back, you don't have the confidence to protest. So I think that's why you need organisation. So, you know, me, I'm unemployed. I want to know that public sector workers will come out and support me. But public sector workers need to know that me as an unemployed person, I support their fight. You know, we need that kind of solidarity and we need to establish in the working class networks of people who understand that they've got each other's backs. When, you know, a couple of days ago, that awful sweatshop collapsed in Bangladesh and we, were real, we realised the plight of the garment workers that, you know, toil there, that we were able to build a protest and we were able to challenge um, the Western family and their massive amounts of money and power that are built on toil and misery and just greed. And I think that's why, as James said, organisation is so important and that, you know, we are, workers have no country. We are an international movement that can challenge the international, oppressive, horrific capitalist system. And maybe if, if John wants to talk about maybe some of the, more, the international um, parts of uh, revolutionary socialism. Just think about it, right? Who actually, within a couple of decades, ended up running America? It wasn't the people, was it? It was the forerunner. We keep saying Dennis O'Brien because today, but I mean, it's just a symbol for huge capitalist power. The people who really ran America <coughs> were the J.P. Morgans, the Rockefellers, the oil companies, the barons, and so on. And they're the people who run it now, despite Obama. Why is Obama such a disappointment? Because in the end of the day, 
it doesn't matter who you elect as president. It's the corporate interests who really run the country. So my answer to your question would be that, uh, of course we're for democracy. Of course we won't rule by the, uh, by, uh, by the people. But in order to get democracy, you need socialism. Because the, without the social ownership and control of the, the wealth, those people will always be able to subvert any elected parliament and so on. It's not just a question, I talked about bribing the politicians, but it's not just a question of bribing the politicians. If they control the resources and the production of the society, any parliament will always bow to their will unless there's a mass movement of working class people to take control um, uh, uh, of that wealth. You have to take the, the wealth to get any kind of real uh, democracy. So I see socialism as the means whereby we would get real and genuine democracy. The way they present the arguments, they as in the ruling class, they always present in a very technical language, credit of all swaps, derivative markets, and these will make you know, like your head melts, you know what I mean? But then you actually look underneath them, there actually is political decisions being taken here, like subsidising capital, like your jobs bridge, for instance. Free labour, basically. That's what they, their intention is to get used public sector workers, take them off the, their wages, use unemployed people to work for half, half their wage, and therefore undermining the, the minimum wage, and therefore it boosting their profits, right? And I think, Although that is terrible, and they are taking the piss, and it is, it's really bad, you know, like my mother works in TK Maxx, and some of the management, some of the roles that, they're, they're, some of the roles that the management are exacting upon their workforce is terrible. But we also have to look at, like, they are, in one way, they are, they are limited, right? And why is that? Because they, their whole basis is run by the anarchy of the market, right? So they think of this idea of, it's a great idea to have, you know, credit default, or uh, as John said, the subprime mortgage lending, giving people that can't afford it loads of credit to buy houses and whatnot. This is, this is insane, right? But this is their logic, because they're led by the argument of the market. But if we take a look at us, working class people, and yes, we're atomized at the moment, but when social movements begin to gather pace, we start to see people thinking collectively, right, to take over their workplace, Right, and they have this idea of Soviets, right? democratically elected, and it's through those ideas and institutions that's how we're going to take over the capitalist society. Right, and that's real democracy, in my opinion. Right? Real democracy in the idea is that we all have a say. Right? But how do we do that is to struggle, continue on with struggling, use, link all these other struggles that are going on around us, and build a big political alternative through that. I empathise with this gentleman over the, the, the need to rationalise and compare the capitalist system and the socialist yes. system. Can I go into a little bit of history here? Because this is 2013. And in this great city of Dublin, in 1913, James Larkin and his men battled this issue of the capitalist landowners and factory owners. They were practically starved to death in the city. Mm -hmm. We're back now at 2013. In the meantime, all our resources in this island had been stripped away, and even at this present time, little mines in Tipperary, Mayo, in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland, where there's gold or any form of metal is being stripped clean, with no return. I agree with John that all wealth is by deprivation. The cake is so big, they take the biggest share. But we do, at this time in history, realize that we're at a crossroads. And it's not just Ireland, I'm quite sure this is Europe mm -hmm. at large. We need to unlearn this capitalist bluff, this illusion that purchasing power is everything, that labor is the most important thing, that that is the real thing. No wealth is produced without either water are the labor of man. And we should be quite confident in saying that this capitalist system, which is red rotten across the globe, can be defeated. And we, we fail to mention Jim Larkin, but we also fail to mention one of the British socialist leaders in Ireland, that was Michael Garrett, the Land League. That man transformed this island beyond recognition. The Irish people hadn't a fit to whatever in at the time. 
but they got the ownership of the property and their lands back. And without firing a shot, there were no revolutionary forces involved. But Michael Davis, singularly, by the strength of the people, the power of the people. So let us not think that protest doesn't work. Davis proved it over 200 years ago. We can do it again. And we do need to do it. Because I, I can't visualize another century in this great city of Dublin that nothing changes. Look down O'Connell Street, the derelict building, the capitalist hoardings are there, everywhere. So I think that's it. Look at who's voting in an extensively right-wing government. It's us. That's the reality. Maybe it's not the people in this room. Why isn't the socialist message getting out there? Yes. There's something wrong. Because the majority of Irish people have come from the Michael Davitt background, where they all own their private properties, small little landed properties. Socialism was always in the cities. It never existed in the countryside. Rural Ireland was always run through Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael with their civil war politics. We are a minority, and we're going to find it very, very difficult to try and turn the wheel. Because what is happening out there is people are hanging on for it to turn around for the next boom. That's the reality. We have to have real policies to put on the table and stop giving ourselves history lessons and say, this is what we're going to do. The only person I can see that spoke something of today is this lady here. We need to start working in communities. We need to start working in building sort of local democracy. They tried Soviets with, with De Valera. That was wiped out. That's not going to work. There were Soviets in Wexford. You know? That's not going to work. You're not going to get Soviets in the countryside. Because all these small little farmers are busy working very well for themselves, hoping that the price of beef will keep them in, in go. That's what it is. We need to try and get something that's community-based, run from community-based, use a symbolist idea that was started in Spain, and work ourselves into basic small democracies to make the move. We need policies that we can put on the table. We're not getting that. All we're getting is, like, Belfast unionists. No, no, no. We have to challenge the powers that be and the way those powers are felt to their communities. Nonetheless, unless we keep an eye on the bigger picture, we can miss, you know, the real shit that's coming at us. Stuff like, and I'm sure John will talk about it because I know he's written extensively on it, stuff like climate change. Um, I mean, I think even the weather we've had, we're having at the moment, and we had last summer, and that they're having all over <coughs> the world is an indication of the sort of policies where, you know, the, 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 the use of carbon fuels and all the rest of it is just doing ridiculous things to the climate. And our world leaders are behaving as though none of these things are happening. So we can have as much sort of small local policies about, you know, sort of recycling and all that good stuff, and meantime, you know, they're sort of, they're building up these gases that are warming the planet with, that give us about another maybe 30 to 50 years before it's irreversibly changed. So I do think you have to, you know, do both. You have to be able to la a act locally. But that's, the, you know, both in, in, the, in the big picture stuff and also in the local stuff, uh, I think individuals are crucially important. And, and one of the things what, what I really wanted to say was, although individuals have a very important uh, role in contributing to the struggle, the struggle itself has a crucial role, as it has a crucial effect on individuals. Um, I'm an individual who's been a socialist for the last 35 years or so, and um, it's hard going. Uh, it's hard going because you think, well, why the hell aren't, didn't more people realise this sooner and do something about it? And I remember being extremely frustrated in my youth, but thinking that, you know, by middle age, it was going to, you know, we'd have the revolution by now. I'm facing into elderly, and I'm still waiting for it. But the thing I think that keeps you going, and that's very important, is that 
What socialism does, and being a socialist that's connected with other socialists is, it keeps you keeping on. It does remind you of the history lessons. There I disagree with you, I think they are important. The fact that there were Soviets in this country, the fact that there were Soviets in Russia, that the first time in human history, workers actually ran the society. Only lived about four or five years before it went down to defeat and the weight of Stalinism squashed it. But by God, what a fantastic example they gave us for the short time they were there. And individuals who learn those lessons of history and are prepared to carry those ideas on and pass them on to others and show their importance and resurrect their importance every time they're dumped on or every time they're rubbished or every time they're mocked or ignored by RTE and the like of RTE around the world. Individuals are hugely important to the project. Um, and I would encourage all you individuals who aren't members to actually get involved. We need you, and you need us. Uh, majority of people are voting right wing parties. I think that's, in many ways, I think most people agree with you. Well, sorry, not most. A lot of people agree with the idea of socialism, but they're a bit pessimistic and never be achieved. So, just a few quick responses to what was said. First of all, remember this country is changing. 85% uh, of people used to vote for explicitly right wing parties, Fianna Fáil and the Gael. That's now down to 50% of people. Uh, approximately 35 40% of people now vote for Sinn Fein and independence. That's an enormous change. Uh, this country is not a rural country. People often say, I mean, you're right, that if like conservatives grew in rural Ireland, there are less, there, sorry, there are more students now than there are farmers. This country is only about 8% of Ireland is now farmers. This is a predominantly urban uh, country with a working class that increasingly is looking to the left. And I, the one thing I do agree with, with, with the speaker on is it's important that socialists don't just talk history lessons, but that we give clear and practical solutions to people who are getting quite desperate. Uh, and I just want to indicate what are some of those solutions, just to be absolutely clear about it. What would a socialist government do? If you leave aside how you get there and so on, what would it actually do? Uh, very practical and sensible things. The first thing we would do is we'd send a letter to the ECB saying, sorry, you're not getting any money more money back from us, right? You're not getting the hundred uh, billion that was pumped in here to make uh, banks here pay off the German and French banks. We're ending the payment of debt. First thing we would do. Uh, second thing we would do is, with the money saved, we would then start a public works program. We'd draw an audit of what work needs to be done in Ireland in terms of uh, care for the elderly, crash facilities, switching to green energy, and we put that money that's now going to bondholders into a public works program. Uh, we would establish a maximum income. We would pass a law. We'd go to people and ask for support for it that nobody in this country should earn more than 100,000 or maybe 80,000. We have a minimum wage. Why can't we have a maximum wage? Uh, we would, we would, one of the things we'd have to look at in, in Ireland would be what are we going to do about these capitalists who are sabotaging this country? Uh, in 2008, 48 billion was being invested in the Irish economy. Today, it's 16 billion. They're only investing 16 billion in the Irish economy. That means you've got a mass, un a mass unemployment. So how are you going to get capital to be set up factories, offices, and so on? And what we have to do is be very simple. You can talk about this. We have to go to every board of director of a capitalist company and say to them, now you put money in and provide jobs and pay people decent wages, and if you don't do that, we're going to come along and give you redundancy notice. We're going to go to the board of directors and say, you are redundant, you can go and retrain as an artist, wherever you want to retrain and so on, but you're redundant. And from henceforth, the people are now taking control of your wealth, and we're going to use that wealth to create jobs. Now, look, I think this is eminently sensible. It's simple stuff. Uh, Brecht said socialism is so, it's hard to understand, but it's so, it's so simple. It's really, really simple stuff. And the last point is in terms of, well, why don't people uh, go along with it? Well, I'd say, first of all, people are beginning to look at it in Ireland. This used to be a conservative country. They're beginning to look at it. But we have a problem in that the corporate media and that particular state, station called Radio Pravda, or otherwise uh, RTE, it's, it's a propaganda station for the corporate interest. That's what it is, right? So we are in a situation where people are, if you like, being pumped these ideas, but like in other countries, people eventually respond to them, question them, if you like, and, and if you like, for other, look, look for other alternatives. And the crucial thing is, really, I'll finish with this, 
is it's when people are not sitting in front of their television sets, soaking it in, but when they're actually starting to do something themselves, then their minds really begin to expand. And that's what socialists are trying to do, and I think we've got a hell of a chance of doing it in the next uh, decade or so in Ireland. Well, Mark Kearden is saying that I'm questioning things on the media, and we were discussing this uh, imbalance in the media today um, on the question of the, the abortion debate because we're constantly seeing on RTE and listening on the radio, they're wheeling out the expert solicitor in particular, and sometimes expert doctors or philosophers, or whatever they are to talk on the pro-choice side without balancing it with somebody who, or sorry, to talk on the pro-life side without balancing it with somebody from the pro-choice side. Now, they did this uh, quite a bit during the Lisbon Treaty, and people in this room would know the two brothers, Kieran and Martin O'Sullivan, who actually measured how much imbalance there was in interviews uh, on both sides of the debate during the Lisbon Treaty, and even though they were bound by laws to give balance, they refused to do it. So we're going to ask Kieran and Martin to do the same on this one. It'll be interesting to see what results we come up with. But um, the, the, the business about question, and it really hit me in Donegal now, I know I've quoted it before already, but a backward conservative county traditionally is now one of the biggest places for protest of farmers, of the property tax, hospital marriages, and all the rest of it. It's really ignited with uh, people's uh, desire to change things and looking for answers. Um, and people are getting it in a way because there was a fella doing a comedy sketch there up there and he was uh, he's a letting on phone call you may have heard it on the radio but he did it up in Donegal it, it's, it's a letting on phone call somebody is ringing revenue hello is that revenue yes if you want to answer speak carefully this call may be recorded I'm going to get you you may know that I will get you no matter where if you want to pay me I leave you alone but if you don't want to pay me I'm going to find you and the voice goes ha ha go on and try <laughs> but, um, this guy from Donegal made it up where I thought it was a brilliant example of how the media is being used to instill fear into people and to instill that idea that you're atomised you're on your own you can't do anything about it you must comply with what the bullies tell you to do and give them all the money that they're looking for from you. So, and, and, and it is true that the only thing that overcomes that is organisation and struggle and all the rest of it. And we're very much seeing that through the various campaigns uh, that we're involved in. And I would just say, people are interested in socialist ideas and alternative ideas. I mean, it's no accident that Bertie Ahern all those years ago, whatever it is, five or six years ago, called himself a socialist too, because he knew it was popular to talk about socialism, uh, not, of course, because he was. So the ideas are there. It's, it's wide open for people to, uh, to get involved in and definitely, you know, to become part of, uh, of movements that are fighting for change. But also political parties are terribly important. We may, as Owen said, sometimes argue about the T's and the, the I's and the, the commas and all the rest of it, but fundamentally people are find, uh, struggling to find a way to build uh, alternative parties to the rotten system um, that we have. And I'm just going to use my last minute to advertise a karaoke night in Ballyferma tonight. <laughs> if a few of you shared a cab afterwards, it'd be cheaper than the bus fare to get up to Lally Road to the Pigeon Club and uh, support the people for profit movement in Ballyferma. So I hope you do come. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to go right back to some of the early uh, questions. Uh, um, the, qu the question about uh, how you would argue in the, uh, the pro-choice campaign uh, and so on. And I think it relates to the last point that, that uh, Kieran Allen was making about having practical things to say uh, uh, about what, a, 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 what we would do and, and making that real for people. Because actually, I think in all the campaigns we're talking about, Socialists do have very down to earth, straightforward, and practical things to say. And I, I think the, 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 the pro choice campaign illustrates that. I think one of the first things that we have to say in relation to that is that actually um, the, the question of the right, a right, woman's right to choose is a class issue. And that the truth be told that the women of the upper classes they don't have a problem travelling to England. They're not going to be the ones who'd find it difficult. Uh, to travel to England or anywhere else. If you've got the sort of money they have, they can always get uh, an abortion, and they always have been able to in one way or another. And so, on. second thing that, that we have to say that I think is a 
socialist argument that's very clear in President Trump is that we have to mobilize people on the streets. You know, that's the key, that we have to put pressure. We have to build a movement of people be taking uh, action for themselves so they get confidence and to put pressure on the politicians because the politicians are cowardly and rotten about it. And I could go on. I'd just say that there's a, again, there's a, you know, it's a history lesson if you, if you like, but among the first people ever to advocate a, a woman's right to choose were socialists. Um, as it happens, the Russian Revolution introduced uh, the right to abortion in 1917. You know, 100 years be, be, uh, before uh, many, many other, 80 years even be, before almost any, anywhere else. So it's a thing, a question on which socialists have a lot to say. I think socialists have a lot to say on all those uh, practical uh, questions uh, uh, of the movement, like uh, the need to uh, stop the privatisation of our, our forests, or how to fight back against the property tax, or um, crucially say in the trade union movement why social partnership doesn't work why Croke Part 2 is rotten, why we need to take back our trade unions from the rotten union leaders and so on. On all those sorts of things, I think we have immediate uh, practical things to say. Um, second uh, point I, I wanted to um, uh, respond to, uh, I mean, we talked a lot about, the I'm not going to talk about Dave Sobran, I'm going to talk about the people who were, we contrasted, I think, um, James at the back, contrasted Dennis O'Brien to the lone parents, the unemployed, and Bree was talking about the travellers and uh, uh, the, the public sector workers and the trade unionists and so on, and all the people who are being attacked. Right. But you think about it, and again this relates to something you said, who are the people who get demonised in the media? By the media. Lone parents, the unemployed, their scroungers, the travellers, the foreigners the public sector workers, whoever needs to be attacked by the system to keep us divided and fighting amongst ourselves. And then, we can come back to Dennis O'Brien, who controls the media, or a lot of it in this country? It's Dennis O'Brien. What am I arguing for here? We need to join up the dots between these things. They're not accidents. They're part of how the system works and why we need a, 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 a socialist transformation now. The very uh, question uh, uh, about the international aspects of it is a, gr a great question. I, I think that socialism has to be internationalist or it's not socialism. Right? You can't, in the end of the day, create a socialist society and sustain a socialist society in just one country alone. You couldn't do it in Russia, where even though it was one-sixth of, uh, of the globe, uh, and so on, and you won't be able to do it in Ireland. You can make a start, and we're ready and willing to make a start, but you have to spread it to other countries. So the, the struggle has to be an international struggle, and we should, I think, see the fundamental division in the world as being not between people of different countries, but between the 1% and the 99% of the Occupy movement, between that tiny minority of the super rich whose wealth exceeds even that of Dennis O'Brien's, by the way, by a good deal. The 100 richest people in the world have $1.9 trillion, the working people of, 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 of the world. That's it. And I regard all those people as my brothers and sisters. Right? And the problem is how to unite those people. And say, so we have the power. There has never been as many working people in the world as there is now. There's now more in China than there were in the whole world when Karl Marx was writing. There's an in spread of capitalism has produced its grave diggers all over the world. The problem is we have to get together, which means, among other things, not falling for any of the tricks that divide us. And that's one of the most important reasons we need organisation. Uh, I'll make two, um, three last points. <laughs> uh, Soviets. Uh, the, the, the comment at the back said Soviets won't work. Um, when you use the word Soviet, people think Russian. That's some kind of Russian institution. Actually, Soviet was just the Russian word for a council. That's all it meant. And what we're talking about here, when we say Soviets, we're talking about councils of working people. That's all we mean. We mean people getting together. Yes, in their neighbourhoods, and yes, in their workplaces, right? and electing people and taking control. That's all it means. 
it's not a such strange or historic thing, something that worked a long time ago and won't work now, not, not, not so. It's a simple, straightforward thing of talking about bringing working people together. And once you start talking about large-scale struggles, especially if you talk about large-scale strikes, it kind of comes naturally. Because if everybody in the town in Dublin goes on strike, right, and there's a general strike, how are we going to transport goods around? How are we going to decide what needs to move, what doesn't need to move? What are you going to do about feeding people and so on? If all the shop workers are on strike, you have to solve those. They're practical problems. How are you going to coordinate the different uh, workplaces and the different group, groups of, uh, uh, of trade, trade unions and so on? You form, you have a meeting of people. That becomes a council and so on. It's a very, very um, immediate and, and practical thing. Then there was the point, something that uh, Nicola said uh, about. She said, I used to think that people like me were not intelligent enough. And it's a very important point. Because one of the things that the system does most effectively is, yeah, is convince us that we're not able. That we can't do it. That that's beyond us. And if they do it to us individually, you know, ruling society, running things, that's for them. That's for the people who went to, you know, the top schools. If you go to a top school, what they do is convince you, actually, that you're destined to rule. The main difference between an ordinary school and a top school, you know, is not that the teachers are so much better that you learn Latin and Greek or that you learn higher mathematics or, you know, that's not the difference. The main difference is if you go to one of their schools, in England they used to call them ironically the public schools, <laughs> but you go to their schools, you learn from birth that you are of the people who are destined to run the country. You go to one of ordinary schools, you learn from, uh, from childhood upwards that other people run the country. Your job is to do what you're told. And this, this is why, because of that indoctrination, which is regularly confirmed by all the media, in terms of who they interview, the way they talk to people, everything, in terms of that indoctrination, is why, actually, that it's not just in this country that most of the time people do nothing. I'm always hearing Irish people say, in Ireland, most people don't do anything. I'll tell you something, that capitalism can't survive five minutes if everybody starts doing things. That's how revolutions start. And in England, where I used to come from, or even in France, you know, people say French are different. Most of the time, most people are not doing much in France. That's how the system survives. The fact that that's true most of the time, however, does not mean it's true all of the time. Right? It doesn't mean it's destined to remain that way. And I come back to this. The circumstances that are developing in Ireland and in the world now are ones where people are more and more being pushed to do things. It's uneven, it goes up and down, comes forward one minute and so on, but more and more people are being pushed into resistance. And so a point that, that, that was being made here, it's a good job that this is happening because actually, I don't want to sound like one of those people who used to go around saying the end of the world is nigh, uh, but the question of climate change and, the, uh, and with the environment, I mean, you say everything comes back to human beings and nature, the labour of human beings are, are on nature. This is true, but under capitalism, the labour of human beings of nature is destroyed and convinced us there's nothing we can do, they can walk all over us. So, like Larkin, you know, we need to rise up uh, 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 against this system. And if you're willing to do that, I think you'll find that the Socialist Workers' Party is the place uh, for you in terms of the immediate campaigns and in terms of the bigger arguments of socialism. So if you like what we say, I do, I do hope you'll join us. Okay. that John was talking about, who owns pennies and Brown Thomas and all these things. They also own a sweatshop that collapsed in Bangladesh and killed almost 300 workers. I think it's over 300 workers that's been found dead 400 now. 400 now, okay, yeah, even more. Uh, most of them women and children because they have to bring the children to work because they can't find a crash to keep them in. 
um, they're not providing credits at the facility where they're working. Uh, so local politician put two extra floors on the building, there was cracks in the building, the workers noticed this, and they were forced to go back in, beat them with sticks. Then the building collapsed and all these people died. So we're doing a stall, like a little protest stall. It's not going to be very big, but like to make people take notice and to make people maybe uh, put pressure on pennies to pay the contribute to the what's it called the uh, compensation for for the families um, uh, and also to pay them a living wage and not to force people into workplaces where they can't be working. So we're doing that at two o'clock at O'Car at uh, Henry Street on at outside pennies on Saturday. Uh, so if anyone wants to come along and help just leave it for it and bring a, a, attention to it, that would be great. <coughs> uh, so buy the leaflet, it's three euro at the back and the paper if you want, and there's other books as well. So thank you very much. See you. Good luck.